First Peter chapter one. Actually, one. First um, Peter chapter one, and, and we're going to be covering, Lord willing, verses ten through twelve uh, this evening. Verses ten through twelve. Let us read this. Said of. Well, let's back up to verse nine. Where it says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Now these verses kind of finishes the thoughts begun in verse 3. Uh, and begins the transition into a, a new thought that picks up in uh, verse 13. Uh, and so we want to look at this this evening and uh, share some thoughts with you on these verses of Scripture. And so we see in verse 10, it says, Of which salvation, that salvation previously uh, referred to here. Uh, we go back in verses 3 through 5. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then verse 9, which we read, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And so this is what he's referring back to. Uh, of which salvation? Uh, this uh, salvation here. And, and I want us to think for a minute on this idea, the salvation, being saved. Uh, it's a terminology that people uh, have a, attached various meanings to. You know, a lot of people talk about being saved. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, what it means to you may be one thing. You go to somebody else and you talk to them and, and, and Ask, and to them it may mean something else. Uh, it is something that because of the diversity of beliefs and things in this world uh, due mainly to the uh, counterfeit religion that Satan has propagated into the world and many variations of that that people have attached different and various meanings uh, to the idea of being saved. Uh, for some, it's kind of the equivalent of making a decision to become a Christian. That, that's, to them, that's what it means. You ask her, you say, well, yes, I, I, I made a decision to be a Christian. I, you know, I can remember when I first started going to church. I had not been raised in church. Uh, I was vaguely familiar with, uh, that's a, very vaguely, with Christianity as such. And I remember going, uh, they picked me up, took me to Sunday school and church on a Sunday morning, and uh, the pastor asked, now is anyone here, here visiting for the first time, raise your hand. So I raised my hand. So the deacons came by and they had a visitor's card and they passed it out, you know, for me to fill out and then drop it in the offering plate when it came by. So I'm looking at this and one of the questions says, are you a Christian? Be quite honest, I wasn't sure how to answer that. 
Because to me, well, Amer I'm an American, and America is a Christian nation. Does that make me a Christian? <laughs> so people's ideas, you know, depending on the level of teaching they've received, is, is going to vary. Now we kind of we know what we mean when we talk about somebody is saved and, and talk about salvation. Uh, but not everybody has that same understanding. Um, to some, it's having their, their past sins forgiven. Now it's up to them to keep themselves saved. They've been given a salvation. Their past sins are forgiven. Now you've got to keep it. Uh, for some, it's something that I'll... You know, we have to wait until we die. They believe in a general resurrection, a general judgment at, at one time. And so one of these days I'm going to stand before God and all my good works He's going to put on one side, my bad on the other. And then if my good outweighs the bad. So again, you know, there, and there's others. Some said, well, are you saved? Yeah, I was baptized. So, and there's probably other variations as well. The idea of being saved, the word means to, to deliver. And Jesus is our Savior. He's the one who saves us. You know, you don't save yourself. I don't save you. Jesus is the Savior. He's the deliverer. And salvation consists of that which Jesus accomplished on the cross for us, which secures the forgiveness of all our sins, eternal life, a home in heaven, a glorified body, our rewards. All of this is encompassed by the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. Notice, if you will, in Romans chapter 8. And verse 28. Paul says here, For we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now we begin, because what Paul goes on to describe now, uh, as, as Peter did, we read there, you know, uh, elect according to the foreknowledge of God through, uh, you know, sanctification of the Spirit unto uh, sprinkling and obedience, you know, uh, of the blood of Christ. And so, Paul is defining here who are the called. But he said, those that love God, well, most everybody says, well, yeah, I love God. You know, kind of like me. Well, I'm an American. I guess that makes me a Christian, doesn't it? You know, if you believe in God at all, uh, most people are going to say, yeah, they love God. But Paul defines for us who truly loves God. You know, and he says, he, he defines it by those who are the called. Not just those who are called, but who are the called. And I like to point out, we got some new people here, so this is old stuff. I've mentioned this before. Every time I come across this verse, I'll probably mention this. But the importance of the fact that definite article, the, in front of the word called makes it a noun. It's not a verb here. It's a noun. It's descriptive of a class of people. That, when you identify that class of people whom he calls the called, the same one Peter referred to there as the elect. And so that which follows describes who is the called, and he uses that because that's kind of in the middle. He said, for whom 
And, and this for whom is referring to the noun called, who are the called. And these are the ones that can claim to love God, who can claim that all things that God is doing is for their good. And we see that all things encompassed then in what Paul says. See, a lot of times people read the Scriptures and they have this really superficial view of things. And they might read that verse 28 and they don't read any further. Well, they like that. All things work together for good. And they want to claim that for themselves without examining whether or not they have the qualifications to claim it. And sometimes, you know, they think, well, I got a toothache this morning. That's, that's not good. He said, all things work together for good. I love God. Why do I have a toothache this morning? Uh, that's kind of a rather superficial perspective on the, the Scripture here. And, and to tell the truth, and this is something I've been thinking about, and I, I'm chewing on a message. They're going to come out eventually. But people's Christianity is very shallow. And one of the reasons it's so shallow is because they don't want to dig very deep. They say, all things work together for good. That's good enough for me. I don't need to go any further. But the Bible goes further. And you need to go further. Well, Lord willing, that's what we're, we're trying to do this evening. And so he says in verse uh, 29, For whom he did foreknow. This is part of the all things. For whom he did foreknow. He did predestinate. Boy, right there you lose 90% of the people. They hear that word and they stop their ears and run for the hills. But it's scriptural. And that's part of the all things. They're working together for good. That's why Paul can say all things work together for good. If you discount that, you have to discount all things work together for good. You can't claim that. Um, but anyway, and that foreknowledge. See, some people have the idea, well, foreknowledge, that means God looked down through all eternity and saw everybody that, that was ever going to be born, and He saw which ones were going to believe. That's not what it's talking about. It's not a, a matter of foreseen faith. If God looked down through all eternity and He saw every living human being that would ever be born, you know what He saw? Let's see. Back over here in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. Look there and see. So what did God see? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God looks down through time and sees man. That's what he sees. Well, he was just talking about in, in the days of Noah. Well, okay, Romans chapter 3. Verse um, 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. God looks down through eternity and He sees all of mankind. What does He see? He sees there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now, if there was foreseen faith, it would have, you know, God would have seen there are those who would seek after Him, those who would believe. 
But what did he see? He said, there's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. When the Bible is talking about the foreknowledge of God, is is not talking about some passive sense in which God saw who would believe, but it is an active attribute of God in which He chose. Actually, the word here, talking about foreknowledge, it has the idea of love and intimacy. It's the same word when it goes in the Old Testament to use, you know, when Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. It's the same word. To know intimately with the idea of love. And because He loved us. He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Matter of fact, then when we go on the uh, John, uh, 1 John, the fourth chapter, and He's talking about not that we love God, we love Him because He first loved us. Well, when did He love us? He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love. He loved us before the foundation of the world. And that's what this foreknow means. And, and talk, well, let's see, I think it's in Acts. Ah. Uh, I was looking here at verse 28, Acts 4:28. Uh, what sir, thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done? But there's a place where it talks about thy foreknowledge and determinate counsel. And I didn't have this in my notes, so I don't know the exact verse, but it refers to God's foreknowledge and determinate counsel. The foreknowledge and determinate counsel. Council and the Granville Sharp rule is you have the two nouns, one preceded by the definite article D, connected by the uh, and. The two nouns then are synonymous, they mean the same thing. That is, God's foreknowledge was a positive and active uh, thing, it wasn't passive, it determined. It was a determinate counsel. And so when the scriptures talk about how God uh, purposed these things according uh, to His will, uh, his, according to the counsel of His own will, talking about before the foundation of the earth, that is His foreknowledge. Well, we spent a lot of time on that work, but we need to understand for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. That, and so we see how because He knew us with this love, He loved us, and so He purposed to save us. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, not just this, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And that's where we get that uh, phrase that he uses all things work together for good to them who love God who are the called according to his purpose and this calling has to have through the preaching of the gospel and the quickening of the Holy Spirit God calls us and draws us to himself theologically refer to that as effectual calling because when God calls us by his spirit it is effectual the, the, the preaching of the word in general, the general call uh, in which the gospel is preached to every creature and every place, not everybody responds to that call. That's a general call. But that which is effectual is particular. It's when the Holy Spirit, one of those whom God loved before the foundation of the world and purposed to save, in time He sent His Son Jesus Christ to die for our sins 
and having accomplished and obtained our eternal redemption, then through the preaching of the gospel, He calls us and draws us to Himself through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And whom He called them, He also justified. So he, he gave us a legal standing before Him that the, the holy and righteous God is just and the justifier of them who believe in Jesus. And whom He justified. And I want us to notice that if you follow this and track this, it's the same from beginning whom He foreknew to the end whom He glorified. And when we're glorified... That's when the Lord comes back and we receive our glorified bodies and we're presented unto Him holy and without spot, without blemish, blameless before Him in love. Right now, I'm not exactly blameless. I'm not unspotted. I haven't received my glorified body yet. I'm forgiven. I've been justified. But I'm still in this old body. And He says, you know, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Corruption cannot, you know, inherit incorruption. Mortality cannot inherit immortality. I have to be made incorruptible. I have to be made immortal. Which, in our, when we're glorified, that's what is going to take place. And so from beginning to end, from eternity uh, before the foundation of the world, when God loved us, set His love and affection upon us, and purposed to save us, unto eternity after the consummation of all things. And God... Uh, sets us before Himself there complete and flawless in love. That is our salvation. It encompasses the entire work that He has done for us. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 10. It says, by the which will, that is, by the will of God, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He, he made one sacrifice for sin forever. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where the remission of these is, that is, the remission of sins, His sacrifice took away our sin. There is no more sin. He said, where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. We don't have to look for anything else. There's nothing that... I can add to it, nothing you can add to it, nothing anybody else can add to it. It's complete in Jesus Christ. This is the salvation. It's a complete package, begun in eternity before the foundation of the world, embracing both that which Jesus accomplished on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection, and also the means of our hearing of the gospel, of our salvation, and He refers to that as the gospel of our salvation Ephesians 1.13 Ephesians it said in whom well let's notice verse 12 that you should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. That is the down payment. It's given to us uh, in surety that we will receive the complete package. So when we're saved, uh, we're quickened and made alive by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enters into us 
and He seals us, and He keeps us, and to us, that is God saying and giving to us that, that earnest, that uh, surety, that we will receive the entire package, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, what's the purchased possession? You are. We've been redeemed. You've been purchased. You've been bought with a price. And that which God has purchased, He's going to make sure He gets it. You see that? You know, you pay for something, you want to get it, don't you? You want to receive it. And you might pay for it now with the expectation of getting it later. Well, you if you pay for it, you want to get it. God's paid for you with the expectation then that He will receive you into glory. And we've received Him by faith with the expectation that He will deliver that which He has promised. And to give us assurance of that, He's given us His Spirit. This salvation. You know, in, in our text, that's what he's talking about. Of which salvation? Um, as I said, most professing Christians today speak of being saved, yet have no real concept of what it means to be saved. Because they don't understand that it's a complete package from eternity to eternity. Completed in God's mind already. And that was His purpose. And when Jesus was praying there in the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter, and He said, All those that you gave to Me, thine they were, when did they become His? In eternity when He loved them, chose them, purposed to save them. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Part of the, the symbolism, the high priest, He had that breastplate. They had the stones on it. Now the Jewish high priest, those stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel because those were who He was representing, who He went in to represent. And their names was a, a, He bore on His heart. You see, Jesus Christ, our high priest, when He entered in for us, we were on His heart. He knew us by name. He calls us by name. Um, I forgot where I was going with that thought. But anyway, oh, and John said, it said, Thine they were, and you gave them to me. That's where he was bearing them as he went to the cross to die for us. He said, and I've, you know, redeemed them. He said, and I haven't lost any. And he's not going to either. Because all that he loved and purposed to save in eternity, he will save and will bring to glory. And he won't lose any. That's where I was going with that thought. Um... And another important aspect of this salvation not only has He saved our soul, He, he saved us spiritually, and He's given to us eternal life. But in this life, He's saving our life. He's redeemed our life. And He's delivering us from the power of sin in this life. Um, sometimes we refer to this as our sanctification as we're given victory over sin in our daily lives 2 Corinthians 5.17 he says if any man be in Christ 
He's a new creature of creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I want you to keep that in mind, and we want to look over in 1 John. First John uh, chapter 2, verse 29, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And, and I want us to read what John has to say about those who are saved, those who have been redeemed. If you know that he is righteous. You know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now, I, I want us to understand here, and in harmony with the other scriptures, he's not talking about us being saved by our works, but he's saying those that are saved will work. Those who have been born again will be righteous. Therefore, those whom you see that are righteous have been born again. Behold, what manner of love. Now here we get back to love again. You know, all things work together for them who love God. We love Him because He first loved us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It's not a matter of waiting till after you die in some judgment, and then you weigh your good works and bad works and find out whether or not you're a child of God or not. He says, now. If you're saved, if you've been redeemed, you're a child of God now. He has purchased you with His own blood. You belong to Him now. Not maybe sometime in the future. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Talk about that glorified body. You always talk about that a little bit at the beginning. I don't know what all that glorified body is going to entail. It's going to be good. You know, I... I don't think we're going to have any complaints when we get it. Nobody's going to say, well, I wish my hair could have been straight, and my hair could have been curly, or I, you know, whatever. You know how people are now, they look at their... No, there's not going to be any complaints about that, that glorified body. But we do know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, my point is this, and we talk about uh, the people's different ideas about salvation. The people who claim to be saved, but there is no change in their lives. You know, they were doing drugs before, they get baptized, they say, I'm saved, and they continue to do drugs. That's wrong. You know? They used to smoke pot or whatever, and then the, they say, well, I got saved. I got religion. They keep on smoking pot. That's wrong. You know, they had a temper. Because, you know, sometimes we, we classify sins. Well, you know, we talk about drugs and pot and different things like that as being sin. Well, all, all things contrary to... Uh, the holiness of God is sin. And we have all have sin in our lives. You know, the Lord saved us. He didn't save us to continue in our sin. Well, Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may be? Because where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbids it. And so here are people talk about, well, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, and they act just like the rest of the world. They act just like they did before they said they were saved. What's wrong with that picture? 
See, we make too many allowances that the Scriptures do not make. Well, for time's sake, we'll, we'll leave that thought there and go on. But this is a serious problem we see today. And those who profess to be saved but continue unrepentant in sin. The Bible says they never knew Christ and Christ never knew them. Ah, uh, now back to our thing, of which salvation, the prophets, those who spake in old time, he's talking about here that the prophets, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. We read in the Old Testament, and I'm just going to use David as an example. He's just one example. He was a prophet as well. Uh, and he prophesied these things. And these prophets, as the Word of God spake through them, and they questioned of what was the time that he was talking about. Was it for them? Or would it come to pass in their time? Or would it come to pass at some later point? You know, it's what he was... They, they inquired and searched diligently, uh, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. So it's the Spirit of Christ that was in them. And this is one of the things Second Peter, he, he brings out. You know, we talk about the inspiration of God. And these men spake, uh, Peter says, over here in 2 Peter uh, verse one, or chapter 1, verse 19. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, David or... Uh, Isaiah or Ezekiel or any of these men, Moses, they didn't speak of their own selves. There wasn't just some feeling that came over them and, and so they interpreted, well, I think this means, David said, God put His words in His mouth. He spake that which God put in His mouth to say. And, and that's what Peter is saying here. Uh, it didn't come in uh, private. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we talk about that. That's the inspiration. God breathed. And so we see here that these men, when they spake, they didn't understand completely what they were saying. But they spoke that which God told them to speak, what God gave them to say, and they said it. But then they were searching to see, you know, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. When they were prophesying about Christ and His death on the cross and those things that would follow, they didn't know when it was going to take place. If it was going to take place in their day or some later point. It did say that unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things. And so, you know, they, they looked to, to see, you know, they searched uh, diligently and they inquired of God. You know, it kind of reminds me of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the eunuch asked him, he was reading the book of Isaiah, he said, of whom did the prophet speak? Of himself? Or some other man. Well, the prophets themselves were inquiring of God. Of whom am I speaking? And it was revealed unto them that it wasn't in their time. That their words were given to minister to us later. When Christ would come, he said, Which are now reported unto you. 
by them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So we see here, this salvation, which salvation? Now he's not saying which salvation with a question mark like there's more than one. But going back and, and attaching it, his statement and that which follows to that which he had previously said. This salvation. He said those that prophesied it didn't understand completely when, as they were doing but as they saw and, and, and wanted clarification, God revealed to them it was not for them. I mean, that same gospel is their salvation, but it wasn't going to take place in their day. But Christ being come, and He has accomplished those things that they prophesy. Um, But not only that, you know, we are so blessed. And we have received the gospel. And, and God has caused us to see and to understand what Christ has done for us. And we can come together here and worship and, and preach the word and teach. And, and we observe the, the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper and, and these things. But you know what's interesting? The angels are watching us and studying us so that they can learn. They're curious. Because they were the elect angels. They never fell. They did not need to be redeemed. I mean, they, they are spirit beings and they go and they do whatever God tells them to do, but they're not redeemed. They've never sinned. They don't understand. And here is man. It said made a little lower than the angels. Angels have powers and can do things we can't. But yet it's man that God has sent His Son to die for and to redeem. And the angels who have surrounded the throne of God and surrounded Christ and saying to Him, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, and is to come, throughout eternity and saw Him, observed Him come into, into this world and take upon Him flesh. And they are curious. Why? Why did He do that for man? And we don't know. But they observe. And they're learning by observing us. That's one thing Paul referred to there in 1 Corinthians 11th chapter and he's talking about our behavior there in the church. We come into the assembly and said that we ought to do because of the angels. Because they're looking down on us and observing what we're doing. In the tabernacle, that innermost covering, from the outside was just an old rough badger skin. Inside, the base was sockets of silver. The walls of pure gold that reflected the light of the golden candlestick. The entryway in the veil was beautiful uh, tapestry of, of colors. But overhead was a weaving of cherubim looking down. So when you looked up, when you was in the tabernacle and looked up, you saw these beautiful cherubim that was kind of formed the ceiling, if you will. We come together here in the assembly. We can't see them. But there's angels looking down, observing us, and learning what it means to be redeemed. What a unique and blessed position we hold in the things of God. Well, there, there's more in my notes, but we will stop there. But let us uh, stand together then. I went a little bit longer than I normally do. But we had a prayer.
and I'm a little gun shy because last Sunday I got called on the carpet because I didn't preach long enough. <laughs> no. Just just teasing. But uh, so I realized, okay, well, I can, I, I can go a little bit longer. I, I don't have to worry, stop right at the top of the hour there. Anyway, let us stand together.